This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on derivatives and the reading on basics of derivative pricing and valuation. Let me begin with an analogy, and it might not be a perfect analogy, but what it might do is give you some sense of what I try to teach my students every semester. I say to them that derivative securities has as a topic this monstrosity of a reputation of being terribly difficult. And while there are some challenges in pricing derivatives and valuing them over the life of the contract, it really comes down to pretty simple basic time value of money principles. And so we'll do that during this slide deck and hopefully I can convince you of its simplicity. Now, when we get to level two, uh, and we start talking about let's price an option or price a swap contract, we need to be a little bit more sensitive to the subtleties. But in level one, hopefully you'll see that this is relatively straightforward. Now, one thing before I get to my analogy is that I want you to uh, watch this video and then immediately afterwards, I want you to go to... Um, I want you to go to the actual reading and look at the 50 problems that are at the end of the reading. And interestingly enough, in the LOSs, we have a handful of compute or calculate, but in those 50 problems at the end of the reading, there is no, let's go ahead and compute something. Now they ask you for valuation and pricing comparisons, like which derivative ha would have a higher price, you know, derivative A or derivative B. And that's probably the way they're gonna uh, test you on, on the exam. So let's go ahead with my analogy. So bear with me here. Let's suppose that you and I decide to play golf next weekend. And we shake hands and we say, hey, I'll meet you at the golf course at uh, 10 o'clock. We're both excited about playing golf. This is the simplest example of a derivative contract. Now, it's not a formal contract. We're not gonna, we're gonna make each other sign a written document, but the handshake is probably sufficient enough and we'll meet next Saturday. So what do we do? We shake today and we agree to do something next weekend. Well, that's a derivative contract because we're not doing anything today other than shaking hands and we agree to do something next Saturday. Now, of course, the issue then becomes that we're trusting each other. And so next Saturday we show up and we have a great round of golf. But what if one of us can't make it? So one of us, let's say I'll call you on Wednesday and say, hey, I'm sorry, I can't make it. Well, both of us will probably be disappointed. I broke that informal contract. What we're doing in this slide deck is we're going to say something like, how do we break a formal contract? So let's make, uh, let's make my analogy e even more relevant. Uh, let me go ahead and do, uh, and do something here. You guys see this? This is a putter my grandfather gave me years and years ago. It's a Tommy Armour Iron Master. It might be worth $100 today. So there's the spot price of this putter. So when we're playing golf, you look at my putter and you say, you know what, Jim, I, I would really like to use that when I go to Scotland next summer to play golf. I'm playing with Sean Connery and I want to impress him with this, uh, with this old time putter. And you say to me, I don't really want it now, but how about if I buy that from you next summer? Let's suppose that's in six or nine months. So I say, sure, spot price is $100. If you want it today, I'll sell it to you for 100, but you don't want it today. How about if I agree and you agree to sell it and buy it for $120? And let's, we'll worry about that when we, when we hit the slide deck here. And so we sign a contract. Maybe we shake hands again, but let's sign a contract. This is a forward contract. This is another basic derivative security. And so what happens is next summer, I'll show up with my Tommy Armour Iron Master Putter, and I'll be sad to give it away to you, to sell it to you, because I love my grandfather and I miss my grandfather, but you're gonna pay me $120, and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm happy for you to play uh, with Sean Connery, the great James Bond, with, uh, with this putter. But here's where it gets fascinating. What are we gonna do if three months from now or four months from now, you pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, you know what, Jim, I can't go to Scotland. I have to break the contract. So we need to decide how to break that contract. What is the value of that forward contract in three or six months? And you know what it depends on? It depends on time, of course, but it also depends on what is the future spot price of this putter? Maybe this putter is worth $1,000 in, in three months. 
And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute now, I agreed to buy this for, what did I say earlier, 120, it's now worth 1,000. You can buy it from me for 120 and then immediately sell it for 1,000. So you're super happy, you took the long position in this contract, which means you benefited when the price went up. I, on the other hand, I'm super sad. Not only am I losing the sentimental value for my to my grandfather, but now I could have sold it for $1,000. And so what's gonna happen is that you and I, when you break the contract, I'm gonna have to pay you the difference between those two. And you'll see that as we go through the slide deck. So this is not a perfect analogy. It's not a perfect example. But as we go through the slide deck, you'll see exactly what I mean if we simplify with a putter, but we can easily extend that to a bar of gold or a barrel of oil or the S&P 500 index. I mean, we could we could write a derivative contract on on just about anything that we might want to buy or sell at some time in the future. All right, so notice what some of these LOSs tell us, distinguish between value and price. That's going to be important. We'll do some arbitrage stuff here earlier. Uh, we'll talk about a forward rate agreement. We'll talk about uh, forward contracts and futures contracts. There are swap contracts right at the top. Um, at level one, swap contracts take up about this much space, but at level two, they take up a, a, a lot more. And then we'll end with a discussion on option contracts. So let's go ahead and start with this concept of arbitrage. And I've learned a valuable lesson from uh, my children and their friends about arbitrage. I wonder if you guys are aware of this, that at the local uh, thrift store, uh, apparently they get the, the new shipments and the new loads and they put it out uh, for the consuming public on, on a Monday. And on Monday, uh, the store is packed with students and adults and regular people who go in and they look and they say, all right, I'm going to buy this for $2 and then I'm going to go list it on an online auction for $50. Well, that sounds like arbitrage to me. Maybe it's not perfect arbitrage. Clearly it's not uh, the arbitrage that the CFA Institute is interested in, in testing you guys on, but you buy an asset at one price and you sell that same asset at a different price in two different markets and there really is uh, there really is no risk uh, apparently there are 12 year olds out there who are making tons of money uh, buying and selling uh, uh, old time clothes I, I tease my children that uh, you know sooner or later you're going to end up buying something that my father wore when he was 80 years old so think about arbitrage really is just a matter of buying gold over here in Arkansas for, you know, let's say $1,000 a troy ounce, and then maybe taking it across state lines and selling it in Tennessee for $1,005. Now, the arbitrage has to be uh, uh, risk-free so that you're really not at any risk of traveling from Arkansas to Tennessee. And so notice what that second teardrop point says. This earns a riskless profit, and that's really important. So conditions for arbitrage, you require no investment, you take no risk, but you have a positive return. Look at that last uh, teardrop point. Arbitrage opportunities uh, are only rare and they happen quickly because there are traders out there who then take advantage. Let me tell you a quick story. Years and years ago, when I used to take my students to the New York Stock Exchange and to the markets up in New York City regularly, uh, we stopped in to visit um, uh, one of my acquaintances and this dude was a currency trader and we he had a big office and, and you know he was pretty high up and he, he said, he said, I want to show you where I sleep. And we went to his office. He had a beautiful couch. And he goes, look, the currency markets are open all the time. So I usually sleep here three or four nights a week because when there's an arbitrage opportunity, I, I don't want to be home, you know, sitting in front of my television uh, or doing the dishes or something. And so that's what that, that means there, a rarity of arbitrage opportunities. And most individuals and institutions who can take advantage of those arbitrage, you know, have tons of capital because they're back by their firm and then they have algorithms that they can press a button and execute it. And then so the two prices converge. And so think about this. If the thrift shop was aware, I guess they are, but if they were 
keenly aware that they could sell them on an online auction. They would close their store down and try to raise money, but those are non for nonprofits. And so I'm guessing that they're really just trying to perform a community service. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, those places will sometime soon say, you know, limited to uh, to three purchases every hour or something like that, much like we did in 2022 with uh, uh, baby formula. Now, the second part of this LOS has to do with replication. And th this is really a cool concept that uh, all we're trying to do is replicate the performance of one particular asset. And so how, how do we do that? Well, look, I own this Tommy Armour Iron Master putter. So I am long on the ownership of this asset. And remember, it doesn't have to be a putter. It could be gold. It could be the S&P 500 index. Well, I benefit when prices rise. So remember that as the long position. But what did I do with you when you were going to Scotland and the great James Bond round of golf? Well, I agreed to sell this to you at some time in the future. So I took the short position. So I was both long in the spot market, right? Here's the spot market, I own it. And I was short in the derivative, which was just a piece of paper that you and I signed. So in the short position, I benefited when prices fall. In the long position, I benefited when prices rise. So that replication really has its roots in hedging. So what does this mean? If I combine the ownership of my putter and a forward contract to sell you that putter next summer, then what essentially I'm doing is I'm saying, you know what, this is exactly like I'm replicating the performance of the return on a risk-free asset. So owning the putter and writing the derivative contract with you is exactly like buying a treasury bill. And that, by the way, that treasury bill would have to mature on the date that you and I agreed to sell that putter the date you were going over to Scotland. And so that's what we're doing on the left-hand side of the equal sign. And I'll let you guys just, you know, this is just simple uh, adding and subtracting from each side that we can take long and short positions and we can replicate a position in one asset. And this replication strategy is really important as we as we make it through not only our derivatives contract uh, conversation today, but it's probably even more important when we get into uh, when we get into level two. Now, let's take a look at that last one, risk neutrality. This sounds an awful lot like something that we really don't want any part of. Right. What what world are we living in when individuals or institutions are neutral to risk? You know, that kind of implies that, you know, we don't really care about risk. All we do is we care about return. But what we have found out, not we as in me, but what these really, really smart researchers have found out over the last, you know, let's say 50 years is that in derivative pricing, the assumption of risk neutrality works perfectly well uh, by just saying something like, you know what, let's assume that uh, an asset just increases in value by the risk-free rate. Now that doesn't make any sense if we're trying to price a risky bond or a risky share of stock, or maybe even this putter. But it does make perfect sense uh, when we try to price a derivative and that risk neutrality is based on the idea of both arbitrage and replication. So there you go, there's the first, uh, there's the first LOS. And so think about this as a summary page here, that what we can do is we can form a risk-free portfolio consisting of the underlying, right? My putter or the S&P 500 and a derivative, maybe a forward contract, maybe a futures contract or an option or a swap contract. It must earn the risk-free rate. And so look at that second embedded bullet point. That's important. There is only one derivative price that meets that condition. And that one derivative price that meets that condition is the derivative price that results from the assumptions of arbitrage and the assumptions of replication that we just discussed. Now, this is an important concept and a handful of those uh, multiple choice questions at the end of the reading test the candidates on this, uh, the difference between value and price. So let's go ahead and make sure you understand this. So at the inception of a derivative contract, especially a forward or a futures or a swap, an option is a little bit different because there is an exchange of the premium. 
But at inception, these derivatives have zero value. Think about the two of us when we shook hands. We didn't, we didn't trade any cash. We didn't trade any assets at that particular time, whether we just agreed to play golf the next Saturday or we agreed to trade my uh, Tommy Armour putter. So at inception, the value of those contracts is zero. Now, what happens then is that over time, the value is not zero because the spot price, I'm gonna keep holding this up because I love this putter, right? There's no way I'm selling this to you for $120 next summer. Uh, but I love this putter because my grandfather gave it to me and I love my grandfather. I learned so much about uh, being an adult from my, from my grandfather as I'm hoping many of you have as well. But there's, there's that spot price, and that spot price is going to change. So look at the illustration at the bottom. So from initiation to maturity, the value is going to be not zero, uh, unless for some strange reason that the uh, spot price just stays at that forward price. But then at maturity, what's going to happen is that there's going to be a value because that spot price, what was the example I gave earlier? A thousand dollars, right? If this putter is worth a thousand dollars, then then one of us is going to win and uh, and one of us is going to lose. And so I think it's important and we, we have a we have a good summary slide here in just a few moments, but look at the very bottom there. So value at initiation is zero value during the life of the contract, let's call that the tenor of the contract, is not zero. And then the value at maturity is going to be the difference between that future spot price and whatever the forward price we agreed to. All right, so here's some good, uh, some good notation. So what are we doing? What was the example? Spot price is $100, right? Uh, T was, boy, what did I say? Six months from now, next summer. Uh, so what's happening here? Look at that third, that third uh, embedded bullet point right today. The long and the short position enter into an agreement. And we agree to trade the putter for, what did I say, $120. All right, so that value uh, at time period zero is, is zero dollars, right? But what happens over time is that the $120 forward price stays fixed but the spot price changes. And so here we go. What are we trying to do in this slide? We're trying to figure out what is going to be the price of this thing next summer. Now I said the spot price was 100 and the forward price was 120, but notice the formula there. Go on the, on the left underneath the timeline. So the F sub zero, so that forward price at time period zero that matures at the uppercase T, right? That's, uh, that's next summer. That's going to be equal to $100 times one plus the risk-free rate of interest raised to the T power. So really all we're doing is we're compounding that out. So the forward price, just think of this as is a future value of the spot asset. So all we're doing is compounding. So that's, that's all we're doing. So the forward price at initiation is going to be $120. The value of the forward contract at initiation is zero. Now what happens, what happens during the life? Ah, so notice what happens. We have the S sub T. That's the spot price at time period T. So what did I say? That's $1,000. So all we're going to do, the value of this contract is going to be $1,000 minus that, that one with that $120, and then what we're going to do is we're going to discount that. And so the 120 occurs, you know, however many months in the future that is, and we're going to take the present value. So that's why, notice we have the 1 plus R raised to the minus uppercase T minus the lowercase T. So that means we're doing, uh, we're doing present value. So this is such a valuable lesson here. Look, what is the value of this contract during its life? Well, it's exactly the same. How about if I rephrase that? It's nearly exactly the same as what you learned about the price of a bond, the price of a treasury bill, the price of a share of stock. It's always, it's always a present value. So what we're doing is we're taking that forward price, which we agreed to next summer, $120, and we're just taking the present value. So we take the $1,000, which is that future spot price, and we subtract 
maybe it's $110, right? So we take the $120 and we discount it at uh, one plus the risk-free rate of interest. So the value of a derivative is the difference between the spot price and the present value of the forward price. Oh, this makes perfect sense. Please pause right now and say to yourself, yes, Jim, this makes perfect sense. This is simple, just like you promised us. And then what are we gonna do at expiration? All we're gonna do is say, well, whatever that spot price is, maybe it's $2,000 on the day that the day the contract expires, then you are super, super happy because then, uh, then you get to buy this putter from me for $120 and then you can immediately go sell it for $2,000. So then you have to decide, is it worth $2,000 to forego uh, playing around a golf with Sean Connery, I would probably say no to that. But uh, others who are not James Bond fans might, uh, might, might not think twice about it. Now, of course, what I'm talking about here is at the maturity of the contract that we're going to trade, we're going to trade the putter for the $120. But in real life derivatives time, most of these contracts are cash settled because the long position is just betting that the price goes up. The short position is betting that the price goes down. And so we'll exchange cash. We can exchange the physical asset if we really want to. But most of these contracts are traded and settled in cash. Now, here's the summary table that I was uh, telling you about. So look at initiation, value is zero. There's the forward price. And then during the contract's life, there's the value and then the value at expiration. And so, uh, Eric, this is what I want you to do. Get out your phone, take a picture of this slide so you have it ready for yourself to memorize. I mean, this is pretty much a summary of what we've talked about over the last, oh, how long have I been babbling on here? 20 minutes or so. How about the next LOS regarding monetary and non-monetary benefits? I mean, let's do the obvious one first, monetary benefits. Skip down to the embedded bullet point. And so, of course, if we own a bond or we own a share of stock, what, what do we get? We get interest payments. We call those coupon payments, right? And we get dividend payments. And there might be other securities out there that pay something else, but we get a monetary benefit if we own the underlying asset, but we don't get that monetary benefit if we own the derivative. Now, there's also another benefit called the convenience yield. And the convenience yield is a, uh, is a extra compensation, let's say. Notice what the slide tells us. It's a non-monetary benefit uh, that's acquired by holding the asset rather than rather than a contract or a derivative product. Uh, you know, going back to my uh, Tommy Armour putter, uh, you know, let's suppose that I own this putter and you and I, we have not signed this forward contract. Um, I, I own this putter and all of a sudden, uh, for some reason, these Tommy Armour putters, they become uh, of tremendous value. Maybe the market thought there were a thousand of these things out there and the reality of life is that there's only there's only nine of them out there. So the, the price spikes and so that's a convenience yield because I happen to own it and the price spiked and then uh, and then I can take immediate immediate benefit of, of that contract. Now going back to my selection of the $120 as the forward price of my Tommy Armour putter, notice the spot price was 100, forward price was 120. Well, what I'm going to say to you is I'm going to say, look, I could sell this for $100 today, but I'll sell it to you next summer for $120 because I need to be compensated for all of my costs. I have to store this thing, right? I have to put it somewhere over there where none of my children can get it and, uh, and, and break it. I can store it over there in a safe so none of my neighbors can break into my house and steal it. And then, uh, and then there are all sorts of costs associated. So costs of storage, and then there are opportunity costs, and then there's insurance costs, and all sorts of costs in there. So. Uh, make sure you're be this this LOS asks you to distinguish between the costs and benefits of owning the uh, derivative versus owning the actual underlying asset. And that's a good summary page there for you.
Now let's go ahead and include those costs and benefits in pricing a forward contract. So skip down to the second arrow point, net costs of benefits. There's a gamma and there's a, th a theta. So the benefits are gamma and the costs are theta. And this is referred to as the cost of carry model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to make you pay for all of my costs of storage and opportunity costs. And what you're going to do is you're going to make me pay for all the benefits I get from owning this putter. Now, I, I might not get an interest payment by owning this putter, and I probably won't. I'm not going to get a dividend payment, but maybe uh, I have a convenience yield. And so you're going to pay me. Uh, you're going to make me pay for that convenience yield. So look at the last arrow point. Costs increase uh, the forward price. Uh, while benefits uh, reduce the forward price. So that should make perfect sense. Now, there are a couple of different ways to do this. What you can do is that gamma and theta, they could be percentages like 2% and 4%, or they could be actual dollar amounts. Uh, and so we'll see that in an example here in just a few minutes. So let's go ahead and go through this slide, this series of slide decks uh, pretty quickly, because all we're doing is we're just taking the model that we did earlier. So look on uh, under initiation there, the forward price today at time period for a contract that matures in time period uppercase T is equal to the spot times one plus the risk free rate raised to the T. So there's our just regular old future value compounding. But now what we're going to do is we're going to subtract out the net effect of the costs and the benefits. And of course, we're compounding them at that same uh, same rate. We'll do that during the contract's life. And so notice there's the gamma minus the theta. And I'll do this again here. We don't have to worry about that at the maturity date of the contract because all of the benefits and all of the costs have been occurred, uh, have it been incurred during the contract's life. So here's that quick example here. We have a spot of 55. The net cost of carry is a positive $3. So in this example, we're using dollars, but you can easily do it in percentage form, risk-free rate. And so let's go ahead and do the price. So all we're going to do here, and this is probably the easier of the two, we'll just uh, do a little algebra and we'll say 55 minus the $3 and multiply it by one plus the 0.03. So that gives us a forward price of $53.56. So notice in this example that the forward price is less than the uh, spot price. In our example, the forward price was greater than the spot price. That was the 120 versus the 100. And so don't be too upset on the exam. If the Institute does this, there's no real reason why forward prices have to be above or that they have to be below. Now, I will say this. Most, uh, most commodities will have forward or future prices that exceed the spot price because of the costs of storing and that there really are no benefits to uh, owning a gold bar, right? You don't get uh, an interest payment or uh, or a dividend payment by owning that commodity. And so in the commodities market, most of the time, the forward price and the futures price exceeds the spot price. But for S&P 500 index, that may or may not be the case, uh, especially just just think about, uh, you know, 2020 when everything was shut down. What happened? We had crashing. Uh, we had crashing stock markets. And so at some point, uh, that forward price or the futures price of the S&P was probably way below the spot price. And then fast forward to 2022, of course, when we have this massive inflation, you know, maybe that's the case as well. Uh, how about this? Uh, how about this? This is a brief LOS here, and we talk at length about this in level two. Let's suppose that instead of exchanging this putter next summer, let's suppose that you come to me and say, hey, you know what, Jim? I'm not going to have any money to fly to Scotland. Can you lend me uh, $10,000 next summer? So we shake hands and we sign a contract. So I agree to lend you $10,000 next summer. Well, this is a forward rate. Uh, this is a forward rate agreement. And so what are we doing? We're just saying something like, hey, let's pick a rate. So next summer, next summer, uh, I think interest rates will be 10%. And so we shake hands and we sign a contract. And I agree to lend you $10,000 uh, 
uh, at a 10% interest rate next summer. Well, what's happening is that uh, I'm agreeing to lend and you're agreeing to borrow. And so what happens? Well, next summer, let's suppose that the market rate of interest is 20%. Oh boy, you're really happy about this, right? I'm not because you, you're you going to borrow $10,000 from me at 10%. When you, if you waited until next summer, you would have had to have paid 20%. And so like all good derivative contracts, this forward rate agreement is really uh, is really going to be cash settled. And so in level two, we'll go ahead and price these uh, forward rate agreements and then try to figure out their value over time. But look at what we've uh, bolded in red. The buyer of the FRA enters the contract to protect itself from a future increase in interest rates, right? That's what I just described. The seller wants to protect itself from a future decline in interest rates. And so notice the bottom. This is probably an important uh, uh, definitional question on the exam. These are over-the-counter products so that you and I, you and I could agree. And of course, we probably are not going to do this. We'll do it through uh, Bank of America or some investment banking firm. Now, why do forward prices and futures prices differ? Now, this is a really interesting concept. So uh, in reality, a forward contract and a futures contract are identical in every way with one exception. Futures contracts are standardized forward contracts. And so these standard contracts are determined by the exchange. So the Chicago, in Chicago, there's an organized exchange that trade these futures contracts. So uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange gets to pick that standardization. And so it might be that if you wanted to trade these putters on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you have to agree to buy or sell, take the long or short position in a hundred of these putters. But you and I, we can tailor this. We could just say it's just one or two or nine or 13 of them. And so this is really the answer to this question. Explain why forward and futures prices differ. Well, the answer is that because of the standardization on the futures exchanges. <clears throat> so notice that second uh, arrow point. Forward contracts are generally riskier because they have counterparty risk. Right here, let me just give you this quick example. If the spot price of this putter is $2,000 next summer before you fly to Scotland, you're going to have a really hard time finding me. I am not going to be around because why would I sell you this putter for $120 when I can go and sell it for $2,000 in that, in that spot market next summer? That's called counterparty risk. And and by the way, I'm exposed to counterparty risk because what if the price of this putter falls to $0 next summer? Well, why would you why would you want to pay uh, $120 for something that you could immediately sell for $0? So there's counterparty risk uh, when we sign a forward contract. But when we do this on an exchange, the exchanges have uh, something called a clearinghouse and that clearinghouse writes a separate contract between the two parties. So there's actually two contracts, one long and one short. And the exchange or the clearinghouse, sometimes they're the same people, sometimes they're not. Uh, they, uh, uh, they take that counterparty risk. And so, I mean, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, right, you know, it's this behemoth uh, of an institution. So it probably has very little counterparty risk. Not to mention the fact that on the exchange, not only is there standardization, but there's also marking to market that occurs every single day. Uh, and it requires margins, which pretty much wipes out counterparty risk. Right, what did I say earlier that uh, this reading doesn't do a whole lot of explaining about swap contracts, but uh, here, here's a good slide. So look on the left, here's a, here's a forward contract. So there's our shaking hands, right? What are we doing? We're exchanging something in sometime in the future, let's say six months. But let's suppose that we, instead of entering a forward contract, we enter a swap contract and it's only for one single period. So you and I sign a swap contract. We agree to swap this putter for cash in six months. Well, those two things on the 
right and left hand side of the vertical line, those are identical. A single period swap contract is identical to a forward contract. But this is what a swap contract does. It says something like, hey, let's not just swap in six months, let's swap every six months for five years. And so a multi-period swap contract is a series of forward contracts. But what does that LOS say? Explain how swap contracts are similar, but different to a series of forward. Well, there you go. Now, how about value and price of swaps? So this is exactly what we're going to do uh, in the swap market, which is extremely similar to what we did back in the forward market. So what are we doing? We have someone who is agreeing to exchange something. Now, swap contracts don't work too well for commodities, although they could. I mean, if I had a peach tree in my backyard and you had an apple tree in your backyard, we could agree to swap apples for peaches every day, right? We could do this then for as long as, you know, the harvest lasts. But what the swap market does is it's great at uh, exchanging fixed for floating. And of course, that lends itself to uh, fixed interest rates versus floating interest rates. And that's why that first diamond point says we're going to exchange net cash flows. So think about this, that I'm paying you a fixed 10%. So I pay you 10% every year for five years. You pay me a floating rate. So sometimes that floating rate is 5%, sometimes it's 7%, sometimes it's 13%, sometimes it's 20%. So what we're going to do is we're going to net, we're going to net those cash flows. So I'm going to owe you 10%. And let's suppose, uh, let's suppose it's $100. So I'm going to pay you $10 every year, right? I'm, I'm signing a contract to pay you $10 every year. But some years you might pay me five, you might pay me seven, you may pay me 13 or 20. And so we'll just, we'll just net those uh, will net those payments. All right, so how are we going to price this? So look at that embedded arrow point. At inception, the value of an interest rate swap is zero. We said that before. You shouldn't be surprised to read that, uh, that line. Now, look at the third diamond point. Swap valuation during the life of the contract is determined by market values. And you ready for this? the value of a swap during the life. Now remember, these swaps are a series of forward contracts. And so they last for, let's say, three years or five years or may maybe even seven years. But what I'm paying you, that fixed 10%, that acts an awful lot like a fixed rate bond. What you're paying me, 7% and 13% and 6% and 20%, that acts an awful lot like a floating rate bond. And so the value of a swap during the life of the swap is nothing more than the difference between those two bond prices. So that's what we have down in the gray box. So here we have two examples. We can either pay fixed, look at the second one, pay fixed, that was what I was doing, and you were receiving the floating, right? Pay fixed and receive uh, floating or pay floating and receive fixed. And so down on the right hand side, the value is the price of the fixed rate bond minus the price of the floating rate bond. So if you're distinguishing this on the exam, just go back to my example of the 10% and do it this way. You can answer any of these questions like this. Just automatically think to yourself, okay, uh, I'm Jim and I'm paying 10%, right? I'm paying 10% no matter what happens. If interest rates go up, if interest rates go to 15%, you're paying me 15%. So there we go, there we go. So the pay floating is losing. The pay fixed is winning because I'm only paying 10 and, and you're paying the 15. And so that's how, and that's how you'll be able to do that on the exam. All right, let's go back to uh, let's go back to that uh, brief conversation we had earlier about options, and let's go ahead and finish out the slide deck mostly with a conversation on option contracts. Now, remember that during the life of a forward or a futures contract, that spot price goes up and down. So one of us is going to be delighted by that change in spot price, and the other one is going to be super sad. Let's go back to my example. If the price of my putter goes up to $1,000, right? You are so happy, but I'm not. 
I'm super unhappy. So this is what we say in the academic world, that during the life of a forward or a futures contract, one of us is going to have a sense of pride. One of us is going to have a sense of regret. And that depends on the value of that derivative contract over the life. And so if the price of that forward, con uh, the price of my putter goes up to $1,000, you're patting yourself on your back. You're saying, boy, I'm so smart. I locked into paying $120 when the price is now $1,000. I'm so proud of myself. Well, me, on the other hand, I, I'm so sad. I have so much regret. I'm, I'm knocking myself on the head. You know, hello, McFly. You guys ever watch uh, Back to the Future movies? Why did I ever sign that contract? I'm an idiot for doing that because now I have to pay. I have to sell this putter for only $120. Well, what if there were a security out there that would maintain the sense of pride, but eliminate the sense of regret? And that's what an option does. An option is the right, but not the obligation to either buy or sell an asset at some time in the future. So you have the right to do something and you have the right to do nothing. And that right is going to cost you money, whether you're buying a call option, which gives you the right to buy an asset, or a put option, which gives you the right to sell an asset. You have to pay the writer or the seller of that option what's known as a premium. And what you're doing is you're buying that option. So there is a price at initiation. The buyer has to pay the seller uh, the premium on, on that option. And what you're doing is you're buying the right to do nothing. And I tell my students this all the time. I say, look, wouldn't it be awesome if you could buy an option so that you never had to come to class and you never had to take a test? Wouldn't that option be valuable to you? Now, of course, you still have to get some kind of a grade, so I'm not quite sure how that works mechanically, but it, it, it gets the students interested in the sense that, oh, Someday I can just lay in bed and I don't have to go to listen to Jim at 8 o'clock in the morning teach me about uh, derivative securities. I can just stay in bed. I can exercise my option. Now, of course, when we're talking about financial options, and let's just suppose it's on a share of stock, that option can be super, super valuable. And that's why sometimes you have to pay a lot of money for an option. So let's look up at the top. Let's get some terms here. So uh, C sub T and P sub T, those are the price of the call and the price of the put. Uh, the spot price, S sub T, is the price uh, of the underlying asset. And then X is the exercise price. A lot of people call it the uh, stock, uh, the strike price. My, my professors in college always call it the exercise price, so that's, that's what I do. So what we're going to do is we're going to look down at the bottom and we're going to say, okay, what happens? What happens at expiration? And it's going to be exactly like we just said with the forward and the futures contract. It's going to be the difference between two prices. But now we're going to take that future spot price. So let's look at the call option. So that S sub T. And then we're just going to subtract out the exercise price. So what did we have earlier? We had, an, we had a forward price. Now we have an exercise price. So they're not exactly interchangeable, but they can almost be. And the put option, you just flip them. You take the exercise price minus the stock price or the spot price there. So think about this. If you buy a call option, you are long in the underlying asset, so you benefit when prices rise. If you buy a put option, you are short in the underlying asset, and you benefit when the underlying asset prices fall. Now let's talk about uh, time value and the moneyness of an option. And the moneyness of an option goes back to here. Let me go back to this previous slide. It's going to be the difference between the spot price and the exercise price, the moneyness of an option. But let's first ask the question that you know, we can sign a contract for a one month option or a 10 month option or, or a 20 year option. Hmm. And so the longer the time to expiration, the higher is going to be the value of this option because you have a larger and a longer time period over which to realize uh, the value. And let me, let me show you what I mean about realizing that value. And this, of course, is exactly what I've been talking about here on that previous slide. 
at the money, in the money, or out of the money. So look at the arrow point there. If the current level of the S&P 500 index is 3,500, that's the value of the underlying spot asset, right? 3,500. If the exercise or the strike price on an S&P 500 index futures contract um, is 3,500, we call that an at the money option. At the money options are fairly rare. <laughs> And they probably only occur when the underlying asset is going up or down and it hits uh, and it hits the exercise price. Let's see, an in the money option sounds like something that we want to be, right? We want to be in the money. Aren't there movies out there? Hey, let's get in the money. A call option is said to be, and it's characterized by the phrase in the money, if the exercise price is less than the current underlying asset price or stock price. And the put is just, uh, just the opposite. And then out of the money is uh, a, sand, a, uh, a situation under which the call is, uh, has a strike price that is higher than the current stock price or price of the underlying asset. Now here's a great here's a great example of this. So you ready? Here's a call option uh, on a share of stock that has an exercise price of 150 U.S. dollars. So look over on the far right vertical column, and you can see 150 dollars in there, and that is at the money. So there's the dotted line. So when the price is at the money. When the option is at the money, that means that the stock price is equal to the exercise price. But notice down below, under the blue, so we have the price is less than the 150. We call those out of the money options. So that's the blue line. It goes squiggly, squiggly up. But then note there, for a little time period, the stock price goes up and it's in the money, and then it goes back down and it's out of the money. And then it goes up and up and up and up. So this is the way I teach my students. This is a great illustration and, and a great graph, is that when they, uh, when my students buy options, sometimes it's going to be in the money and sometimes it's going to be uh, out of the money. And most of the time, it's not going to be at the money only when uh, it hits that, that crossover point. So this is a really cool illustration about in the money and out of the money, but it also gives you a sense of what you're faced with as an option owner. What do you do? If you buy this call option, note that you're not happy when prices are low, right? When they're less than the exercise price. You're super happy when the prices are high. Now this is a great exam question, not just for level one stuff, but also for level two, when we talk about the uh, Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. And so uh, go ahead and get out your phones, take a picture of this. This is, I mean, I can't guarantee what the CFA Institute is thinking, but if I'm making up questions on the exam, I'm gonna ask a handful of these, I'm gonna ask at least one of these, and so these are relatively easy. Uh, so take a picture of this, have it in your folder, of all the pictures that I've asked you to take uh, over all these videos here. And so really all we're doing is looking at uh, at this first sensitivity. Some calculus people might call it something else. We'll, we'll do that in level two. And so for a call option, notice that as the risk-free rate goes up, as volatility, which is probably measured by standard deviation, and as the costs go up, uh, the, those are directly proportional, so they move, move together, but as options that have higher exercise prices and higher uh, implicit benefits, those are inversely proportional. And then, of course, if you know that middle column, then just the opposite is true for the final column for a put option. Now, remember when I was emphasizing this concept early on about replication? Well, put call parity it really is based on replication. All right, so notice what we're doing here. Let's suppose that we want to put together a protective put strategy. So if you close your eyes really quickly uh, uh, or skim back on the slide deck to one of those first slides where we had replication, think about this. We own the asset and we buy a, want to buy a put option to protect that asset. So we own the asset and we're going to buy a put option that has an exercise price. You ready? You ready for this? So we own the asset. We're long on the asset. We benefit when prices rise. 
when we buy a put option, we're short on the un underlying asset, which means we benefit when prices fall. So when we execute a protective put, what we're doing is we are hedging the ownership of this underlying asset. Okay. All right. So there we have value at inception. We have the put option plus the stock price, right? Time period zero. Makes sense. All right, so forget about all that. Let's do something else. Let's suppose that we buy a call option and we buy a risk-free zero coupon bond. Hmm. We buy a call option, which means we benefit when prices rise of the underlying asset. We buy a zero coupon bond and it's a risk-free zero coupon bond. So that price is gonna be at a discount. So when we buy that bond, we know we're going to increase in value over time because, well, it's at a discount and the price has to rise, right, to get that future value. Well, if we pick a bond that has a maturity value that is equal to the exercise price of both the call option and the put option in that protective put strategy, we are owning a portfolio. We have a call option and a bond. In the, first, in the first portfolio, we had a put option and a share of stock. Now we have a call option written on that same share of stock and a bond. All right, you ready for put call parity? What we can show is that those two portfolios, they replicate each other. So look at the last, uh, the last arrow point. Since the two strategies have the same payoff, well, they must have the same present value, but the reading calls it acquisition cost. So what we can do is I can scoop out that C plus the present value of the bond, and I can put it up there uh, next to the P plus zero, and that's put call parity. Put call parity is nothing more than telling us that owning a put option and owning the share of stock can be replicated by owning a call option and a risk-free zero coupon bond. And so there is put call parity in a nutshell. And there's, uh, there's the formula there at the top. So the call plus the present value of the bond is equal to the put uh, plus the share of stock. What we can do is we can rearrange. So this is more of the replication if, now notice up at the top, we have C plus the present value of the bond. If we do a little algebra and throw that over to the left-hand side of the equal sign, what we can do is we can replicate the payoffs of a call option by, are you ready for this? Buying a put option, buying the share of stock, and selling a risk-free bond. That's the minus sign there. Notice over there on the right-hand side of the arrow, the reading calls this a synthetic call, but all we're doing is replicating. Synthetic means that you are replicating the payoffs of a derivative with some other stuff. Now that is an equal sign there. So the call option is gonna give you the same payoffs as if you own the put plus the share of stock and you sell a risk-free bond. So you can form a synthetic call and a synthetic put. Ah, let's look at this last one here and let's link this back to one of those first LOSs. And I love linking LOSs here. An arbitrage opportunity is created when the put call parity does not hold. All right, so let's go ahead and work through just a quick example here. Put and call options, exercise price of 50. Oh, and by the way, of course, the call and the put option, they have to have the same exercise price. And the bond has to have a maturity value of that exercise price. And don't be upset that you might think to yourself, hey, Jim, I've never seen a bond mature for $50. And so don't, don't worry about that. that. That really is just a small detail. Expires in 120 days, underlying asset, $52, risk-free rate, 4.5%. If the put is selling for 380, the price of the call option is closest to. All right, so notice what we're doing. We're explaining put call parity. We're linking it back to this arbitrage LOS. So here, let me just go back here. So we're going to use this idea of replication and put call parity to back in algebraically to the price of the call option, and here it is. So 
notice we have call option on the left hand side is equal to the put there's 380 that's given to us the uh, underlying asset $52 and then we're going to subtract out the present value of that $50 bond and notice in this example we're going to go ahead and uh, pretend that a year has 365 days so 120 over 365 and this is probably the convention that I would use remember the Institute can swing back and forth between 360 and 365 but it'll probably have to tell you that on the exam so there we go 652 of the call price otherwise an arbitrage opportunity exists so if if this turned out to be let's say it's seven dollars Oh my gosh, what could we do? Well, we could either either buy or sell the call option, or we could go and buy or sell the put, buy or sell the uh, share of stock, or buy or sell the bond. And so you can use replication strategies, or you can just go into the one market. And so put call parity is really a simple model, but it has super cool uh, explanatory uh, powers just about derivatives and and what makes uh, what makes derivatives work uh, by the way as I go back to that put call parity equation you know that that and I'm going to repeat myself here that that is an equal sign up there and you can rearrange that to f f form any any kind of an uh, of a synthetic instrument Now, put call forward parity. The good news is you, you already you already know this, but all we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and substitute a forward contract. All right. So notice what we have down at the bottom. Just skip down to the bottom here. We have on the right hand side of the equal sign, we have the call plus the present value of the bond. And on the left hand side, we have the put option here. Let me go back here just to remind yourself. Uh, uh, we have the call there's put call parity there so all we're doing is we're substituting the option for the forward contract so to the left of the plus sign to the left of the put we're just substituting a forward contract in for um, in for the option but go ahead and look at that last point there uh, by setting the call equal to the synthetic protected put we have put call parity for options on forward contracts so this really is super cool stuff you have the derivative and then you have the double derivative now this is where students say something to me like you know what jim this doesn't look very simple uh, can you simplify it for us and this is where we go into this binomial option pricing model which is really really simple let me try to convince you of this what we're saying here today is we're saying something like all right the stock price is whatever it is right s sub zero so look at the on the left hand side of the arrow so there we have s sub zero what we're going to say is that we know that stock prices they go way up and they go way up and they go way down you know we do we know that they have an unpredictable pattern but that unpredictability is probably bounded by the standard deviation of that underlying share of stock so the binomial mo binomial model is really a simplification of all of that stuff that says something like hey you know what from today to time period one we think the stock price can either go up or it can go down that's why we have a lowercase u and a lowercase d so just think of this binomial model as hey stock price can either go up or the stock price can go down and that means that at time period one there we have the s which is the plus which means uh which means the stock price goes up s sub one if the stock price goes up and then look down below there's a minus sign though the stock price at time period one if the stock price falls and all we're going to do is compound it out so u is going to be let's say 1.1 and so we take the stock price which is let's suppose it's 100 today and u is 1.1 so the stock price is going to be if it goes up it's going to be 110 right 100 times 1.1 and let's suppose that the d is 0.95 uh, and so we take 0.95 times the stock price and so we have a model where the stock price is going to be 100 today or it's going to be either 110 
a year from now, or let's say one period from now, or 95. So you might think to yourself, you know what, Jim, that really just doesn't sit well with me. I'm not sure I like that model. And so forget about that. And let's go to the derivative where, let me remind you, I talked about risk neutral pricing. And so this is where this whole thing comes in. So look right underneath the S sub zero, there's a C sub zero. So let's suppose we're trying to value a call option using this binomial model. So there's C sub zero. So all we're doing is saying that, hey, if we buy the call option, we win if the stock price goes up, if it exceeds the exercise price, and we lose if the stock price goes down. So notice right under the S plus and the S minus, there's a C plus and a C minus. Hmm. So let's suppose this is a one period option. So what happens? Well, what do we know? We know that our call is only going to have value if the stock price exceeds the exercise price. If it doesn't, then our option expires worthless. So that's why we have C plus in time period one equals the maximum of zero or the difference between that higher stock price and the exercise price. So let's go back to time period zero. So let's suppose we buy a call option, which gives us the right, but not the obligation to buy this share of stock for, let me pick a number, $104, right? So the stock price goes up to 110. We agreed to buy it at 104. Well, we win, right? So the call value, the call price, one period from today is going to be 110 minus 104, $6. We win, we win $6. Now suppose, suppose that on the other hand, the stock price falls. Stock price falls to 95, or what did I say? 94, 95? Hello McFly, I can't remember which one I said. Let's pick 95. What did we agree to do? We agreed to buy it at 104, but the price is now 95, why would we, why would we pay 94? I'm sorry, why would we pay 104 when we can go to the New York Stock Exchange and buy it for 95? So this is an out of the money option. The first one was an in the money option. And so what, what happens here? We, we say maximum of zero, well zero, right? So this is an out of the money option. And so if the stock price falls, notice there's an equal zero over there. So this is how we value, this is how we price a call option from time period zero to time period one. This is a one period binomial model to price a call option. Now, one thing that you might ask yourself is, oh, wait a minute, Jim, we, we spent some good time in quantitative analysis saying, okay, if something goes up or, or something goes down, they have to be linked to probabilities. What if the probability that the option increases is 99% and the probability that the, that the stock price decreases is just 1%? Oh my gosh, well that really, really explains, that really compounds, that really uh, emphasizes the need for a probability. So look down on the bottom right, there's a pi, you guys remember pi from third grade, and all we're gonna do is we're going to measure the probability of an uptick. That's what pi measures. So we're gonna take one plus r, which is risk-free rate, by the way. We're gonna subtract D, and then in the denominator, we're gonna take the, the U minus the D, and that's gonna give us our probability of an uptick. And so there's our call price, time period zero, is equal to a weighted average. It's a probability weighted average of C plus one and C minus one. Here's a good example. It was the value of the call option if the stock price currently at 50, exercise price of 52, risk-free rate is 5%. U and D are 1.2 and 0.75. And by the way, don't worry about where we get the 1.2 and the 0.75. I'll show you how to do that when we get to level two. And it's based on, as you can imagine, standard deviation. All right, so let's go ahead and do this from left-hand side, and let's start with the underlying stock price. So it's 50. All we do is multiply that by 1.2, and we get 60. So S plus 1, $60 over on the right. 
Let's take 75% of 50, and we get 3750 for the S minus 1. All right, so now we have this binomial path for the stock price. Well, we buy the call option. What are we willing to pay for that call option today based on this binomial path for the stock price rising to 60 or the stock price falling to 37? Well, if the price rises to 60, we win, right? We agreed to, uh, ha we had the right, but not the obligation to buy the share of stock at 52. So we win $8 if the stock price goes up. But what happens? We lose, we lose all our money. The value is going to be zero if the stock price goes down. Why would we exercise our option and pay $52 for something that we can go to the New York Stock Exchange and pay $37.50? So let's go ahead and ask the question, how do, we, how do we compute the price of that call option? So let's do our pi, 1.05 minus 75, divided by 1.2 minus 75, that gets us 0.67. Let me just remind you, here's the LOS, explain. So you need to explain that 67% is the probability of an uptick, which means 33% has to be the probability of a downtick. Uh, upward motion and a downward motion. So we're going to take 67% of 8 and 33% of 0, and then we're going to divide it by 1 plus the risk-free rate of interest. We're just taking present value. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. What's the price of a call option according to the binomial model? It's a present value. Just like bond prices were present values, just like stock prices were present values, just like Forward and futures prices were future values because we're doing something in the future, but now option prices are present values. So there we go. We're willing to pay $5.10 today to buy this call option that gives us the right but not the obligation to buy the share stock at $52 a share. Wow, this is super cool stuff. Now, remember the difference between uh, European options, which can only be exercised at maturity, uh, I'm sorry, at expiration, and American options, which can be exercised uh, at any time. So look at that first diamond point, and this is important, right? American call prices will differ from European call prices only, only if this is an option on a share of stock that pays dividends or a bond that pays interest. And it's only, only because of the existence of dividends and interest payments that there might be, and I'm just going to say might be, there might be a reason to exercise the option before it expires. And so if this is an option on commodities or non-dividend paying stocks, or maybe a zero coupon bond, then those prices will be the same. And that takes us through what I think is a super fun uh, slide deck. Uh, hopefully you realize the relative simplicity of what can be a super challenging reading for many candidates. So what was your homework assignment? I told you to watch this and then get out the reading and go look at those, uh, go look at those 50 multiple choice questions at the end of the reading and then go to our practice questions and you know i say this in many slide decks you're tempted to go to the mock exams but don't do that yet hey i had fun today uh thank you for watching and good luck studying